Hey guys, before we dive into the show, I wanted to tell you about the perfect trailer queue blueprint, which is 100% free and you could download it right now over at thetrailermusicschool.com forward slash blueprint. Now this blueprint will help you to completely understand the structure of trailer music, how to build tracks that will be more licensable and have more impact and capture the right people's attention. So whenever you start writing a cue, make sure you've got this blueprint to hand and you can use it to help speed up your process, feel more confident that you've crafted a well-structured trailer cue before you send it off to that publisher or editor or supervisor. Okay, let's get into the episode. Hey guys, you've heard it from me so many times about how awesome the Protégé course is. Uh, So I thought it was probably best for you to hear from some of our students. I went into the Protégé course with a pretty unhealthy amount of insecurity about the music I was writing at the time. Um, Struggling to to structure tracks, to finish them on a regular basis. We're going to have a bunch of people basically working in the industry get briefs every week and then we publish them i was like what (laughs) that sounds like insane i've never heard of any other people doing that sort of thing like actually like mentoring people on like the level of like no we're doing it for an entire year yeah that that's why i think the project thing is just amazing because it's it's targeted it's okay we want this type of music for this type of application let's do it and then okay here's where you fell short here's where you succeeded and it's just amazing i feel like i've learned so much and improved so much of my production skills i've gotten better at percussion and better at uh my capacity to write tracks quicker has improved and i've gotten better at like Uh, properly responding to feedback and I feel like now there is more of a future for me uh, in the library world than there was before I started. It's definitely a course that I would recommend doing and there are so many courses out there but this one really hammers home on how to write to brief, how to write quickly and how to write uh, expertly as well. Honestly uh, the, the videos are very user friendly, they're very engaging and you get to have breakdowns of some of Richard's most successful tracks or Elephant Music's most successful tracks um, which has been really useful as well so I thoroughly recommend uh, to dive right in. Protégé was one of the best investments that I ever made in my career. It did level up my game and not just in skill but also in my confidence. It just made me um, a more professional composer and a better composer. But the course did exactly what it intended to do in that it kind of demystified the whole composition process, um, taught me a bunch of good habits. And I suppose most importantly, and what I'm the most grateful for, is the fact that it, it actually helped me to really enjoy writing music again. There you have it, guys. We are opening our doors for applications for the 21-22 Masterclass year with Protégé.school. Go to protégé.tiny.us forward slash apply. That's protégé.tiny.us forward slash apply to start your application. One man with one microphone. And one awesome podcast. Welcome to the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. Hello, guys. Welcome to another episode of the Trailer Music Composers Podcast. Uh, I've got an exciting one for you today. Uh, This is uh, a strange reversal of roles. Today, I have a very special guest, Aurelie Webb, a very, very talented composer, she is going to pretty much kind of host the show for me today. Uh, <laughs> uh, she is going to be asking those questions, which uh, I get all the time from various people online or my students, but you guys can't hear the answers enough. And uh, to be honest, I can't hear myself saying the answers enough there. I, I need a reminding a lot, of the, a lot of these questions. So without further ado, Aureli, welcome to the Trailer Music Composers podcast. Hello, thank you so much for having me. If I'm uh, hosting, I have very big shoes to fill, so uh, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Just blabber, and that's that's yeah. pretty much that's what I do. So. Brilliant. <laughs> so um, yes, no, thank you for having me. I 
confess, I know pretty much nothing about trailer music apart from the fact that I know I like it. Um, so yeah, I just have a few questions about, I suppose, the process and the, the business side of things as well, which is also something, um, you know, we, we can't forget in our line of work. Oh yes. Um, so yeah, I, if it's all right with you, I'll just, um, I'll just kick off. Yeah. Fire away. And don't right. worry like, if you know nothing, because like <laughs> I said, this stuff is so important to be reminded of and, mm. you know, and actually sometimes, not having a clue about something means that your questions are much more perceptive. I don't know about that, but let's hope. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, So uh, my first question, how do you suggest one approaches trailer music and how should you view different trailer music for different genres? Okay. I'm going to answer that question with another question. Mm -hmm. (laughs) When you say how, how is anyone going to approach trailer music? Do you Mm -hmm. mean the process of writing it? The process. Yeah. So you've just received, um, well, no, sorry. I'm, I'm already getting ahead of myself with another question I have, but (laughs) you have an idea for a piece of trailer music that you want to do, for example, for, um, a thriller, something like that, a dark, a dark thriller trailer. Yeah. You have the brief and the concept. You have your door open. What do you do now? Uh, ooh. <laughs> uh, have you got a spare two hours? Uh, Go no, for it. <laughs> trailer music is all about impact and character. Mm-hmm. Uh, at its most fundamental if you can create impact in a very short space of time and communicate character and to a and probably to a similar degree a sense of space and scale then mm-hmm. if you can do all those things then you're absolutely winning so that's what you're trying to do with your piece of music can i create character impact and space mm-hmm because our, our our sort of two minute twenty cues, which is the the length of feature length trailers, are there to communicate the entire narrative of a movie, and usually the entire setting of a movie. And when people think of trailer music, they think of huge, epic stuff. But you've mm-hmm. gone thriller, which I like because that's that's one of my specialties. Uh-huh. Um, with regard to thriller, you think about thrillers uh, and you think about space and tension. Uh, you can generally uh, write a trailer music cue with the idea that your cue is divided into three acts Act one, Act two, and Act three, mirroring the film itself. You know, introduction of the characters in the world, Act two, the problem, Act three, the resolve. Although it's not such a resolve in Act three for trailer music, it's more of a raising the stakes mm-hmm. uh, like it would be in a film before the result. Mm-hmm. So with thriller trailers, you can kind of imagine it's all the problem. You are building the problem from the very start. And the best way to approach it, in my humble opinion, would be to find a signature sound. Do you know, uh, do you, I don't know what signature sounds are? Well, I can imagine what it would be. But, um, <laughs> sounds like tell a story. Yeah. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Signature sounds are sounds that give your track like an identity immediately. Mm-hmm. They, some people confuse signature sounds with originality. They mm. don't have to be original, and they don't have to be one of a kind. They just have to give your track a sense of character straight away. Uh, I usually use a cello mm, or a violin for a sense of character or some kind of organic instrument and the or if you're not if you don't have any instruments to hand the easiest way is to find a sound you like and just use the pitch bend yeah that's just a good trick because it all of a sudden it becomes human yeah completely because there is some kind of human element to the sound and once you have this sense of character through a sound you're going to use that as kind of like a paragraph within your track you're going to plop it down four bars in eight bars in 16 24 32 whatever it is at at every every, any given sequence Um, and that in itself will give you the trailer's structure 
and I'm a big fan of writing the track, sketching it first in full, even if it is just using a single sound or hits, because then you go, huh, I know I'm working with the, within these realms. And you don't start doing the mistake, which I used to make, which is making a huge sounding act one so that whatever you do in acts two and three mm. is just always playing catch up. Interesting. Yeah, I guess you need to always get bigger than that first point and you, you don't have anywhere to go if you, um, if you blow it too soon. Exactly. Uh, and, the, and the other mistake a lot of people make when they're, when they're doing trailer music is they start too big. Mm. There is no reason why you cannot just start with that signature sound, but do not give the signature sound away in all its entirety. It's kind of like that signature sound is peeking behind the curtains. So mm. the, the kind of sonic metaphor would translate to using a high pass filter or a low pass filter to mask most of the frequency. So if it is, to, if it is like a cello going, you know, you'd put it through a, uh, a high part, a high cuts filter. So it would, it would sound more like mm. this sort of muffled mm, version of itself. And then you would gradually open that high pass, high cut, low cut, whatever it is you're using throughout mm-hmm. the track. So thriller trailers are much, are probably the closest to score writing in trailers with a couple of exceptions that I would, I, I would imagine is the case. Uh, so the main aim for a th- thriller trailer is a constant build of tension. Mm-hmm. And however you go about that needs to start small and simple and sparse and build. So if you were to go, if you were to approach this rhythmically, you would start with long durations and gradually increase your durations, much like a drop in uh, an EDM track, you know, ding, 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 etc. See, there I go. I've rambled and I forgot what I was saying. Um, I mean, I mean, that's, that's it at its most simple. Mm. You don't, you don't need to have a huge amount going on. The only Mm. thing I would say that you do need to have is a sense of scale. And the way that we as trailer composers would do that is through humongous sounding hits. Mm. Uh, So you could use, Sample libraries like Damage. Um, I've forgotten all of the sample libraries now. Uh, Or Hans Zimmer's Percussion is excellent as well. Mm, That's a good one. Yes. Uh, But when you're talking about trailer hits, they are full spectrum hits. So it wouldn't just be Mm -hmm. sort of the low rumble of a tom. It would be a sub as well as uh, the punch of a mid tom and the crack of a snare and the hiss of a cymbal all happening at the same time. Wow. So it's like this. Okay, yeah. It's like an explosion happening. Mm. So we, we use those to give a sense of scale and weight. And then everything else in a thriller trailer can be nice and small and claustrophobic, you know. Mm. Also think outside the box. Don't don't go straight for a sample library. Like use your nails, like click your nails together. Yeah. For percussion. I saw a, a composer and she mm. did a video of her tapping on her phone as the percussion in one of her keys. I was oh, like, really? that, that is amazing. Very nice, yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, but yeah, so those things are kind of going to give you a sense of character. Mm-hmm. If you find a signature sound, if you kind of think outside the box with regards to other sounds and you give it a sense of scale, that, and that's pretty much how I would go. But that's a really kind of diluted answer to that mm. question. I mean, and also it does change a little bit depending on what genre you're working in. Mm. So if I was working in anything that was more harmonic based, so for instance, with thrillers, you're often just sta- staying on the route, mm. just staying on a C, the bends. Whereas if you're going for a family adventure or an epic hybrid or standard orchestral, you're going to be using a much richer harmonic language. Mm-hmm. And for that, I would sketch the cue out on the piano in its entirety. But nothing more than four-part harmony. Mm, okay. So act one would be some kind of statement of the theme, a very, very simplified version of the, of the theme, perhaps even just the first, or the first note of every four bars or every two bars 
whatever mm-hmm. theme that is. So it, it indicates the intervals within the theme and a statement of the baseline. Uh, act two would be a fuller version of the harmony with the fuller iteration of the of the melody. Mm-hmm. And then I would just bring it probably a, a, a ostinato throughout act two. Act three would be full um, statement of the melody and everything going like the clappers. <laughs> it's a, a good segue onto my next question then, because you're, you're talking about um, sample libraries, but also making your own sounds and recording. So yep. what do you usually do? Do you have, um, do you do hybrid scores where you've got a kind of MIDI um, foundation and then you record live instruments on top of that? Or is it sort of a different situation for every project? Unhelpfully for you, it's a different situation with every project. Okay. And also depending <laughs> on the library, some libraries have the budget and the mm. reputation to uphold where they will always record audio machine. A good example, they will always record with a full orchestra mm. um, or at least wow. full strings and brass, you know, where it's just like to have that kind of like, it's a statement to say, this is a full orchestral recording. It's mm. a statement, not just a quality, but also of, you know, yeah. we invested in this. Yeah, definitely. Um, so hmm. sometimes it will be a case of recording. It mm-hmm. will almost always have MIDI. Mm. Even when you go, even when you record a full orchestra, you will pad it out because people are so used to hearing orchestras that are essentially like 300 pieces. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> a 60 piece orchestra sounds feeble in mm-hmm. comparison to, you know, because we're we're all working with samples where there's, 25 violinists and we've layered that four times so there's at least 100 violinists going like the clappers and Mm. so sometimes it'll be a case of mocking out creating a mock-up then recording up an overlay and that Mm -hmm. could be as simple as the top line on a string with a string player or a smaller ensemble or a like i said a full section Mm. Uh, i have rarely if you know only once done a full section recording with trailer stuff. It's almost always been small ensembles or solo players, mm. which I, I'm happy with, to be fair, because the samples we use are outstanding. Yeah, <laughs> you know, absolutely. I've, I have done sessions outside the trailer music world where we've recorded and the clients turn around and said, well, this doesn't sound big enough. And I said, yeah. that's because the budget you gave us wouldn't mm. have bought a full orchestra. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've been in the same situation. Yeah. 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 So, so it's, it's, I mean, it's an interesting world because also depending on what style of trailer music you're writing in, trailer music kind of gets put into this big bucket, which everyone thinks is just epic music. But mm. for instance, I just wrote an album of string quartets. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's string quartet writing with big drums, basically. Beautiful, yeah. It was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. And, and that kind of ties in nicely with the four-part writing. If If you practice four-part writing it gives you the versatility to go small ensembles like a string quartet Mm. or just writing for a piano because you get Mm -hmm. some idea of the uh of the patterns you're recording and playing with or a full orchestra Mm. um yes but most of the time it's almost all in the box yeah i mean it makes a lot of sense doing that and i think that's you know practice that pretty much every composer is is doing now and and that's why it's so fantastic that we do have these tools of incredible sound libraries to fall back on yeah Uh, the thing is they are of such high quality sometimes Mm. i just can't i can't hear the difference Uh, Mm. i will say is is that real is that live i don't i yeah it sounds live Uh, and i almost don't want to put my bet on it because I don't want to reveal that I can't tell as a professional mm. musician, um, which is usually just a nod to how incredibly well it's been produced. Yeah, no, completely. I, I do think it's very important as well to be able to record your own stuff. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you don't want to lose that skill and you don't want to lose that element of creativity that is added by recording. You know, because I think it's so easy to use a sound library. They sound so great. They're so uh, nice and simple to use, but you don't want to become lazy. No, no. Uh, 
I think the the thing, the issue there is, uh, mm. as a trailer composer, it's almost expected to use these sounds and samples. Interesting. Um, especially in certain genres, you know, if you're going for the big the big blockbusters, they're going to want to hear full orchestra and not just full orchestra. You know, as I said, like ensembles of hundreds of musicians. You know, the brass needs to sound galactic in scale mm. and the, the strings need to sound incredibly gritty and aggressive but also a vast and the only way we as as musicians stuck in a single room with a keyboard can achieve that is by the hard work of other people recording those mm-hmm. players meticulously and beautifully mm. Um, so I, I, I I'm not sure whether I, I would say it's lazy at all I think that that's it it's part of our arsenal and yeah. I think whatever gets the job done and that's mm. what's important whether it is samples or not because if no one can tell then what's the difference yeah very true yeah <laughs> mm, that's a good way of thinking about it <laughs> I suppose taking a step back then so before you even start with writing how do you get a job is it this is it a situation where you receive a commission for a specific project or are you more creating a library and then the clients will search through that and license a track for their, for their trailer? There's two camps. Mm-hmm. One is custom work, which is, as mm-hmm. you say, working too brief with the trailer houses. And the other one is working with a library and producing mm. production music, essentially. Uh, I have done both. I, mm. I don't do custom work anymore just because I found it too stressful. Um, because also we've got the time zone difference. So I would work all day here till six and then people in, that, in LA would wake up and say, Hey, can we have changes? Yes. So then I would work from six until, you know, two in the morning and then get up again and they'd have more feedback for the changes. And mm. I, I didn't enjoy that. I didn't enjoy that process. My, so like, like we said earlier in a previous conversation, um, if it doesn't light you up, then what's the point? So mm even though there are huge wins to be done, to be taken for custom work, uh, I much yeah. prefer the more relaxed approach of just working on an album by album or track by track basis. And then the uh, publisher and the library do the work of pitching it. That's really interesting. So then if you're working with um, a library, are they then giving you a brief of, you know, are they saying we've got a, a little bit of a hole here? We'd like you to write an album of this, or is it more driven by you? Are, you? are you thinking what I'd really love to do next is I don't know an album of creepy horror trailer music or something like that? Like who who's in charge? I guess. Yeah, if it varies, it depends on the size mm. of the library and how the library runs. A a Mm -hmm. lot of libraries will have a release schedule where they will have already planned out the year's releases, uh, Mm -hmm. where it might be that you approach them and say, hey, I'm super good at at hybrid orchestral. And they say, oh, we've got a hybrid orchestral album coming out in October. Do you want to write for that? Hmm. Or it would be a case of the library having a rough release and then you approach them saying, hey, I want to do hybrid orchestral or in your in." your example i want to do creepy horror tracks mm-hmm. here are some like tracks they would then say oh we actually don't have a, a horror track release or we don't we don't want to do that <laughs> so yeah <laughs> uh that's kind of when you're first of working with a library and then it becomes much more uh give and take really where mm. they will approach composers based on stuff they want and also composers can then approach them Mm-hmm. with projects they want to do uh, i'm in quite a privileged position because i've worked so closely with uh, vic uh, elephant music since mm. its inception that you know vic, vic and i will have pretty open conversations about what tr- what albums i will be working on mm. where it's it's not sometimes it will be him saying oh we need this rich can you do it other times it'll mm. be saying hmm can i do this so the string quarter album was me saying vic can i just do some string albums yeah and he was like yeah <laughs> that's brilliant I mean, I think that's so great to have a relationship with someone where, I mean, I guess it's not not feeling comfortable, but just being able to say, like, this is what I really want to do now. Like, do you think there's a market for it? And um, it's almost, I think it can be really helpful for the creativity to just continue 
getting the excitement about you know your music up right and if you're really invested in it Mm -hmm. I sort of think the music is always better yes yeah I completely agree uh trendy music Mm -hmm. well that's with every piece of every style Mm -hmm. of music is is very um trend driven so if Mm. you can if you are approaching a library about something that you would like to work on if you can show them a placement that's happened in the last three to six months that sounds like that, mm. then you, that puts you in good stead because that's basically saying that someone else has paid money to have music like that on their trailer. It's like social it's proof. Yeah. Um, so normally if trailers are releasing, when they're working on their trailer company, sorry, when they're working on their release schedule, they're doing their research. They're looking at what trailers have landed, what the music's like, you know, what companies are doing. Also, it will look at the Hollywood release schedule. What movies mm. are coming out next summer? You know, uh, the the bigger, uh, more trailer invested libraries will actively say, "Okay, well, Marvel are releasing this film." So my mind went completely blank. I couldn't think of any Marvel films. I'm ashamed. <laughs> it, next summer, so they will say, "Right, let's get together an album that we're going to pitch to them." Mm, okay. So when Star Wars in, was in production, we were working on Star Wars uh, tracks to pitch bef- like as they went into production. Mm. Um, so it is a lot of that. Um, mm. There is also the other side of it, which I have been very blessed to have been on this side of it, where an album that you get on is a little bit out of trend, but then suddenly becomes on trend. Uh, so yeah. you are then asked to write more of that based mm. on the work. That, so I did a series of albums called Throat, which are all dark thrillery horror stuff mm. very organic sound design essentially um mm. and the first one we did of that i recorded my cello in a certain way that that cello stem got used so a stem is where they take a, a, a single either single instrument or usually a collection of sounds and use just that on the trailer mm-hmm. still pays as well it's just a single stem uh, mm. they said oh we love this cello stem and then off the back of that Vic said hey rich should we do a whole album of that. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, yay, playing badly. Very um, cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. I, I'm very blessed because, you know, you get a lot of kudos from other composers bec- because you're landing big films. Mm. And it looks cool on your CV. You know, you're like, mm. yeah, done those Marvel films. <laughs> yeah, done those horror films. And it looks great. Uh, so, yeah. that, you, you know, we've talked, haven't we, about it? focusing on and being proud of yourself Mm. so it's nice to have these trailers you know so i landed three trailers last week or in the last two weeks one was for a video game Mm -hmm. um which i used to play all the time which for me like the nerd in me was like yay (laughs) um one was for an amazon prime tv show and i forget the third one but again you get them and you go Hey, this is excellent. I'm, yeah. Well done, me. Mm. Um, so it's nice to have that. Very, Worth. yeah. I mean, I think because I was um, getting myself up to speed on your latest placements, actually, before we spoke, so I, I knew that I was going to be talking to you about it. And it is, you know, you have so many gems <laughs> that you've been involved with. Um and it's, it's very, very cool. And of course, it must be a situation of, you know, you're able to kind of leapfrog using projects. And, you know, if you've done something like the, you know, Marvel, for example, it must get you in, you know, certain circles where people are aware of your music and then maybe put you forward for other similar projects. Yes, it's, I think it's, I think often as a composer, it's not necessarily important whether you have achieved something. It's what your Mm. library has done that you are Mm. working with at the time. The thing you're talking about when you start to get recognized as a composer is when Mm. your music from a library continues to land. Mm. Because then they go, who did these? Oh, it's the same person. Oh, we should get them involved. Mm. Or, Or so like the throat releases, it it's the same editors that use our music oh, okay. which we're very blessed with because we seem to be landing consistently with the same editors and I, yeah. 
maybe it's like a, a lucky rabbit. Maybe I'm the lucky rabbit's foot <laughs> on the key ring. I don't know. Uh, well, maybe that's arrogant of me to say that, but uh, it's definitely a case of, you know, and it's the same, isn't it? When you start to build up a relationship with someone and whether, okay, yes, I don't actually ever talk to, okay, I very rarely talk to the editors, but mm. pretty much never talk to the editors. Mm. But obviously I'm doing something in my music that's speaking to them. And that comes back down to that thing that do the music that lights you up because that will transfer to someone else. Completely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's something that you should be proud of as well, that something in your music is really resonating with, with this group enough for them to keep saying, well, this is the sound that we want on multiple things. Mm. I, I, I think that's something that, you know, a lot of composers really aim for, right? To have their music resonate with people um, and have people I, identify continuously with the sound that they're putting out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, when I was first starting out, I used to go to a lot of the musicians' unions. Uh, they would hold mm. like talks and things. And uh, Guy Mitchell Moore was on the, mm -hmm. uh, he runs, uh, oh, what, Music for Media? Is that what it's called? Mm, I I think so. he, he runs an online course teaching people all across the board scoring, basically. So I kind of walked up to him and was like, hey, Guy, you know, I really respect you. This is awesome. I'm very excited. And he said, send me your stuff. And he kind of sent over uh, his, some thoughts and he pretty much just said to me, just focus on your niche. Mm. Yeah. Just do what you do best. Don't master everything. Yeah. You know, don't try and be Hans Zimmer like everyone mm. else is trying to be. Do you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, th I think that advice still holds true. And mm. I'm often recommending that to my students in the training music school and our students at Protégé where we're just saying that if you get your niche, that means it much going to mean it's much more likely for you to stand out. Mm. You're going to be the '80s hip hop dude. Be the '80s hip hop dude. You know, yeah. uh, and I think that's really important. Uh, mm. And I, th I think you know, with your scoring work, the, there is a definite niche that your scoring work is falling into. It's this lovely, mm. subtle mixture of strings and organic sounds with quite harsh and stark electronics and mm. I mean, that in itself has its place in the trailer world uh it's just a case of like shifting a couple of elements because mm. a lot of the things with placement work is if your track it doesn't sit easily or hasn't got the right build the right structure it's less likely to be used unless mm. you're like queen <laughs> yeah uh so it's understanding the structures you know the act one, act two, act three, once you've got mm. that going and you've got your niche, you are in a strong position. Mm. I think that's, yeah, really valuable advice for, um, for anybody in the industry, you know, practicing um, any kind of music, really. Um, yeah. that, that's definitely, yeah, very, very nice to, to follow that through. Um. So what would you say, or do you think there are differences to approaching composing trailer music to the way you might approach scoring a film, for example? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't done a huge amount of film work, but I have done film work and I have done mm. features. Uh, and scoring a feature, again, depending on the director you're working on, working mm. with, uh, is very different to... The process, um, it's not the practical process of trailer stuff. Mm. At its core, I think all creation is the same. Mm. You're essentially trying to make music that matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and with trailers, as with scoring, you're trying to communicate mood. Mm. With a trailer, it's it's more of an overarching mood of the film. Um. And sometimes of the trailer campaign, which can be different to the film itself. But in its in its essence, they are very similar. You're trying to write beautiful music that you love that captures the visuals or mm. captures something about what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. There, of course, are a million differences because of the things that we do in trailer music and the things that you do in scoring. Um, 
but I can only speak to my limited scoring experience. Uh, so mm. you'll have to uh, fill me in on the on the scoring <laughs> side of things. Uh, you know, we the thing is also trailer writing. You very rarely see the cut. And if you do, you have to sign an NDA and it will be a work in progress, which is similar to scoring. Interesting, yeah. Uh, mm. If I, my most recent custom work when I have done it mm. is spin the, <laughs> it's, it's like, how am I supposed to work to this? It's black screens and blips when those cuts. <laughs> huh. Okay. And, a title, and occasional title cards. Like, yeah. So it's basically just like nothing for 20 seconds. Boop. <laughs> title card yeah yeah so you go oh this is this is inspiring Uh (laughs) (laughs) that's so funny yeah I mean you always have to use your imagination but that's really uh taking it to the next level (laughs) yeah I know wow but that's why it's important to understand the structures because if you know the structure Mm. of trailing music it you can pretty much guarantee that act one's gonna end there act two's gonna end there and act three's gonna end there so it's just a case of like maybe shaving a bar or two here or there. So mm. actually, if you've got the structures in, you're okay. Mm. I think that's a super interesting way to work, actually, and really practicing that skill and ingraining that almost like muscle memory, you know, just knowing that this is this is what I need to be doing. This is where it's going to be progressing. Um, it's a very interesting way of working. I I love it because it's mm. I think there is freedom in limitation. Yeah, and completely. I think the danger with scoring work sometimes is that you are dealing with essentially 60 minutes of music mm-hmm. where you can be so free form that yeah. you lose all um creative drive. I know yeah. Christian Henson talks about creating his templates and sticking to his templates. And I think that's mm. absolutely genius advice. Just being like, these are the seven instruments I'm using for the entire score mm-hmm. as a kind of an equivalent limitation. Mm. I completely agree. Yeah. I mean, it's very easy to, um, to lose your way with it. And I think if you're doing a feature or a series, for example, it's easy to forget where you started and then when you get to the end of the project, it's almost like you've scored two different things because it, it sounds completely different to um, the sound you created at the beginning. Um, but interesting that you brought up templates, though. So do you, do you like working with templates? Do you have different templates for different genres? or how, yes, how do you uh, yes, yes and no. If I'm, if I'm mm. using... Uh... If I'm doing big orchestral stuff, I'll load up a template because yeah. the time it takes to load up 70 channels. Mm-hmm. So I, you'll just load up the template, boom, there's the orchestra, there's all yeah. your favorite samples. If it's if it's more, if it's smaller in scale, mm. or if it's kind of organic sound design recording work, I will often start afresh and use saved presets. Mm. Um, so where you can save stems. So if I'm doing, uh, so for instance, the string quartet, I have a, had a preset of uh, solo strings. Mm. So I just loaded that up and that was my session. Mm. Um, so it's, it's, it's a mixture of the two, depending on how big you're working. Yeah. But I think a, a really good tip is to have not just templates as in whole uh, session templates, but also have batches of instruments saved. So you have your favorite mm. sub sub drums, you have your favorite low drums, your favorite mid drums, all in a stack, all in a stem. Mm. So that if you're starting out with a piano piece and then you suddenly go, you know what, this could do with some big drums. <laughs> Two clicks later, you've got 40 drum, drum libraries loaded. Yeah. And, and that saves so much time. So I think because of that, I use templates a lot less than I used to. Mm. But for big orchestral stuff, templates are very, very handy, especially when you've done all the snazzy routing with everything being panned and all that stuff. Yeah, very true. It's nice when you can just open something up and know that you've done the sort of, well, I guess the leg work, and you know that mm-hmm. it's going to sound really great as soon as you start writing. 
Yeah. I think there is also a pressure in that too. <laughs> yes, for sure. Because, because all of a sudden you have to perform and what you write has to sound great straight away. Mm. Um, and I think that's why sometimes I avoid a template and I'll start with a piano and just be like, yeah, just noodle on the keys. Oh, there it is. Yeah. And there's the idea. And then it, then it flows. Yeah. Whereas if I start with a string section, I'm thinking, Oh, could I make a better, you know, ostinato mm-hmm. here? Oh, I probably couldn't. Oh, what should I do? This has been done so many times. And then you, I've gone down the rabbit hole of self abuse. Yeah. <laughs> Haven't we all? <laughs> yes. Daily. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a sort of, I suppose, a, a generic question. You, you always hear it. I'm sure you've had it a thousand times. But is there anything that you've learned from your career that you think that younger composers starting out in trade in music should know or that you yourself wish that you had known when you were starting out? Cool. <laughs> Oh, that's a toughie. A big one. Most, <laughs> mostly because of the bit you added at the end. Mm. When I think about uh, other composers starting out now, I think about the discussion we had previously about having a niche. Mm. But something I, I've started talking about more and more lately is being nice. Yeah. Uh, so many composers I now work with have gotten work, not necessarily because they were the most talented composer in the room or the best producer, but because they had great email manner mm, uh, and yeah. they were positive. You know, we've talked about this with uh, social media. There's so much negativity around that. You know, just if you can't say anything nice in these music forums, guys, don't say anything at all. You know, mm-hmm. we're all striving to do our hardest. Yeah, striving to produce work we're proud of. So having people who you consider your peers just laying into your writing or your products or whatever it is you're doing, Mm. it's just mean. Mm. I think actually for composers starting out, you kind of want to think about the business as a group of friends. I, I think the trailing music community is quite small and also very, very close you know, a lot of us know each other and mm. there's a lot of banter, which is nice. Mm. And I have to say, in the trailer music world, I have experienced the least amount of abuse, if any. Really? Comparatively to sort of the larger music community. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe that's like a, it's a little trailer music family. I don't know. But, uh, no, I, think I mean, that's... I think that's lovely to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, it's, I think it's really important. Um that you are remember that you're a person and everybody else are people Mm. because if you're truly passionate about what you're going to do you're doing you're going to pursue it and you're Mm going to get better because you're pursuing it yeah so the thing that's left over there is well how are you going to maintain those relationships and with regard to me i'm doing the thing i wish someone had told me which is mm. everything. <laughs> no, no, it sounds arrogant. I mean, like I wanted someone to give me feedback on tracks. Mm. I wanted someone to show me how they produce music. I wanted mm-hmm. someone to, 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 to be, to say, Hey, look, this is my logic session. And this is exactly how I wrote it. Yeah. Um, which, which is what I do. I do it in my courses. In fact, my courses, I show them from start to finish exactly mm. how I do everything because that's what I just desperately wanted while I started out. I didn't understand how you get those big drum sounds. Why does no one talk about it? <laughs> yeah, How do you do it? And, and definitely. I'm, I'm not one of those people that's that sits there and figures it out, you know, in a short space of time. It took me mm. years to figure these things out because I ha- the problem is I'm very inquisitive. I have a lot of questions about a lot of things. So I found it, a little magpie mind, found it mm. very difficult to focus on anything. Um, so a lot of my experience has been through doing yeah. So I always wished someone was sort of open about their process so that I could see how it was all worked. And also so that I, you know, I could I could see that, oh, it's not all this like impossible mystery that you don't understand. Yeah. He's just recorded his cello and twisted it using the same plugins I have. Mm-hmm. He's and he's automated this and I've got that drum library too. And you see, oh, it's not magic. You know, people I, I get very frustrated when people talk about 
art air quotes <laughs> like it's something that you you are gifted with everybody yeah. everybody has innate artistic ability so it's not something we need to hide from each other it's a i think sharing is something that's very important mm. yeah i know that wasn't like a practical thing but <laughs> no 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 i think that's very practical i mean i i think that's again very good for everyone um and I agree. I suppose that's what's quite good about the, the scene nowadays. There are so many tutorials on YouTube and stuff like that. But yeah. the one thing that I always think is lacking is basically assuming that the person watching knows nothing and you just completely start from scratch. You know, you just, the first step in the video or the tutorial is I'm turning on my computer. You know, that that's like the very, very start because it, it is like that, and I think it feels very inaccessible sometimes to people, definitely to young people, and um, it does feel magical and mysterious and like you're never going to understand it, mm -hmm. um, which is why I think it's great that you, you, know, you take on students and you have these courses that really start from scratch. It's very, very valuable. I think that... I, I completely agree. And I think I, I know I have had some people come onto the courses being like, whoa, this is going deep quickly. Mm. Um, the difficult thing with the, the, the reason why I've often avoided it with starting from the very, very beginning is so much of what you're dealing with is door specific. Yeah. So it, it, it then becomes that I'm not necessarily teaching music production. I'm teaching logic. Mm. Um, I know, I know, I know you. A lot of it is sort of uh, cross pollination, as it were. But um, mm. I think that's why I've avoided it because I, I, I'm not a massive tech nerd. I don't really like getting deep into the the yeah. inner workings of Logic. I just want to know how what's how do I get a sound out of this thing? Mm. Um, so I guess maybe that maybe that's it. How to make a sound out of Logic? Boom. Yeah. <laughs> as a, the good first step. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because actually it's funny you say that because I, I, many, many years ago when I was about 15, I got computer music and they had a little CD which had a digital audio workstation. I put it onto my computer. Mm. I didn't know that you're supposed to have a sound card. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get any sound out ah, of it. And thus yeah. ended my digital music for the next five years. <laughs> oh, that's heartbreaking. I know. I was, well, I, I went back to my four, I had a four track at the time. So I was like, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But so, yeah, I suppose if only someone there had said, Richard, you need a, you need a, yeah. you know, sound card, dude. <laughs> but it's like that, isn't it? You know, you, there's something that you kind of convince yourself is completely impossible and you'll never understand it. And then somebody just says something so simple and it clicks and you just think how did i ever not understand it in the first place yeah you know yeah i agree mm. i think um i think that's all i think that's yeah all of Amazing. my questions <laughs> o'reilly thank you so much for taking your time to ask me these questions um i hope they were helpful for you and I, I hope they were helpful for you, you guys in the audience I hope you enjoyed our chat uh, I know we certainly did um, and thank you for taking your time to listen so thank you again O'Reilly thank you so much for having me really enjoyed it